there is economic thinking out of the box. Yeah. Continue. Um, so today we have a very special guest, in my opinion. <laughs> well, our guests are special, but in my opinion, this is the special one. Um, and our lecture today will be in English, so it's a bit different from the other lectures. But first of all, I want to tell you who is organizing this lecture series, because it is at uh, Christian Albrecht's University of Kiel. Uh, but it's not organized by the university, but rather by a student group at our university. And we're called Rethinking Economics. Um, we are a group of students, mostly economics and business students, but also others who have started uh, a few months ago to well, campaign for a more diverse teaching in economics at our university. And one of our first things was to organize this lecture series. We are part of an international network, Rethinking Economics, that, as you can see, is um, present in most parts of the globe. And, well, we are one of the little dots up here. Now, why Rethinking Economics? I, I like this picture because it shows quite clearly what's the problem. In most universities, the neoclassical economics is what is taught mainly or exclusively, but there are so many other economic theories that we barely ever hear of. So we decided to take things into our own hands and um, start by teaching some more theories. If you want more information on all of these theories, exploringeconomics.org is a really good website where you can find all the information you need. And um, of course, our lecture series is a very good source. We are now this is the fourth uh, lecture of, of our series so far. All of the ones so far have been in German and they are all available on YouTube now if you've missed them. Now today will be the first one in English on post development. And I will uh, introduce Federico de Maria in a second. Just uh, for those of you who don't speak German, as a hint, in two weeks, the, this lecture will also be in English. All the others are in German. Okay. Um, now, before we go to uh, Federico's talk, just the uh, technicalities for everybody, because most people, I think, haven't been here before. So Federico will give his talk. It is being recorded, so we can put it on YouTube afterwards. That also means that if you ask a question in the after the talk, you will also be on the recording. You have the chance to ask questions um, during the talk or any time during the discussion by writing in the Q&A section below. And um, you. Well, if there is a question in the Q&A section that you really, really like, then you can give it a thumbs up so it will be ranked higher and we will start answering the questions with the ones that are that got the most thumbs up. So we can make sure that the questions that um, most people are interested in are being answered first. When you want to ask a question, so you will write it in the Q&A section and after the talk, we will give you the chance to speak. If you don't want to be on the recording or if you, for whichever reason, you don't want to ask it yourself, just write in brackets that we should read it out for you. Then we don't ask you to read it, but we will read it for you. Okay, just write that when you write the question. Otherwise, we will give you permission to speak when it's your time and you will ask your question yourself. And I guess if you feel uh, un confident uh, asking in English, you can also ask in German or in Spanish or Italian. And Federico can ask, uh, can answer in English, assuming that you can understand English at least when you're here. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. So um, Federico, Federico de Maria is, um, <laughs> it's, it's really hard for me to introduce him because he's my personal star. <laughs> Um, he's done his bachelor's in Italy, 
And then he moved to Barcelona and uh, did both his master, well, his master's, his PhD, and his postdoc at the uh, Autonomous University in Barcelona. And he's worked with all the big names like um, Giorgio Scalis and uh, um, Alberto Acosta, John Martinez Allier. So all of these uh, all inspiring names. And I guess by now he's one of them himself. <laughs> he's, he's almost as famous as the other ones. Um, his background is basically ecological economics or the, how, e how the ecology and the economy work together, or, uh, interact. But um, he has recently edited the book Pluriverse Post-Development Dictionary. And so we invited him today to give his talk on post-development because he has also had a lot of experience in, um, well, he, he's done his master's thesis on, a, on an ecological conflict in India. And he's also been to China and Argentina. So he has worked with people from so-called developing countries. So I guess he knows what he's talking about. And I will give the floor to you, Federico. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And we're really excited to listen to your talk. <laughs> Excellent. So thanks. I'm going to share my screen now. I guess you can see my screen now. Uh, is it? So it is super nice uh, being with you. I'm, I'm very happy um, to be here uh, tonight with you. Thanks, uh, Martina, and thanks, Sarah, a lot for uh, organizing this uh, session. Um, I spend a lot of my time working on these uh, topics nowadays and also since uh, more than a decade. So I'm happy to, to share and, and discuss with you and I'm looking forward to, to learn from you also. Um, as, as you were uh, presenting, Martina, I was uh, thinking about my personal history. Uh, one could do, I guess, a psychoanalysis of why each of its researchers has chosen a particular topic. Uh, but in my case, I come from a small village in the Alps, in the northern of, of Italy, and um, I'm of uh, culturally of Catholic uh, origins, if you want, and I've always been concerned a lot with justice. So at the end of the 90s, I was very much concerned as a young teenager with, with poverty and inequalities and so on. And I was part of what would be called nowadays alter globalization movement and so on. You're probably too young. To remember this, you might have not been born. I'm not so old, though. The good thing compared to Alberto Costa and John Martinez Alier and Jorge Scalvi is that I'm much younger, so I still have many more decades to go, hopefully. And um, so, so at the time, I was concerned with this topic, so I decided to study economics. So this is somehow I, I share with, with many of you, not all of you, but but many of you. And, and suddenly something happened to me, which probably also happened to you, which is that um, you start studying economics and then suddenly you become a little bit confused. And at least that's what's happened to me. Because it, you know, classical economics is confusing uh, in, in, the, in the way of, of the assumptions that it uses and the methods and so on. So I kind of got frustrated that um, the economics that I was learning at university was not really helping me to understand the world and hopefully give a response to the challenges that I was seeing. And I think this is probably the reason why many of you uh, today are here, because we see that there are challenges which we could agree uh, with, for example, the sustainable development goals, no? Uh, but then there is no clear uh, way out of the mess or the mud in which we are in nowadays, even more with, with COVID-19. So I think heterodox economics is, um, is interesting in this sense, and also uh, discipline beyond economics uh, towards a more multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary approach. One of the books that I read uh, back then when I was a student of economics was a critique uh, to development by uh, Arturo Escobar, so the making and unmaking of, of development. And this is mainly what I'm gonna share with you today. So basically the aim of my talk today is I want to make 
a cultural and an ecological critique to development, to how economic development is understood by the hegemony, by the mainstream, and therefore by economics also. So the idea that uh, we need to produce more and consume more, and this will make us better. This is the mainstream idea of, of development. So I'll do a cultural critique to it in the sense that um, the assumption that uh, there is a single project for everyone on the planet, which is development, which has to do with economic growth and producing and consuming more is problematic because there is a cultural diversity around the world. So that I think it's not so much out of the common sense to think that different people and different community around the world might have a different understanding of what a good life is, uh, which might be different from the hegemonic version that basically comes from the Western uh, culture. And this is how development is understood too. I will mention a little bit also an ecological critique to development. If economic development is understood as basically a synonym of economic growth, then uh, the question is whether economic growth is compatible with ecological sustainability or not. My position regarding this debate is very clear. I think it is not. I will not enter into the debates, into the details of it, but we could, if you wish, in the, in the debate. Uh, and then finally, this is like my first, the first part of my talk, the cultural and ecological critique to development. And the second part would be exploring, so what? Like, do we have any alternatives to this? So I will present what we call alternatives to development, uh, which degrowth de uh, or post backstum as you call it in, in German. I'm told you, I don't speak German very well. I used to study German, but I was a very bad student, so I didn't learn it really. Um, so degrowth will be one um, in which I've been involved for quite a while now, and I will speak about, but um, we can also discuss about other alternatives to development from the global south that altogether compose uh, what we call the pluriverse. So what you see on the screen now, uh, this book, The Pluriverse, is basically an inventory of alternatives that, uh, to development from all over the world and mainly from uh, the global south. There's a lot on feminists, for example, if you are uh, interested to. So this was like a kind of um, introduction to my talk. So let's get into it. Um, the talk might sound uh, boring, but I think if we want to do radical thinking, if we want to challenge mainstream economics, we need to go uh, and look at the roots uh, of the concepts, the roots of the problem. Uh, this is what a radical understanding means. So we have to do a little bit of history, I think. Um, in this sense, today I will try to trace an history of development. Development as a concept uh, in the history of humankind is very recent. In fact, the way in which we understand development today only comes from basically after the Second World War, as I will argue in a minute. So there is less than a century in which humankind thinks of development as the way forward. For the rest uh, of the history of humankind, it has been something very much uh, different, right? So one could trace this short history of development, one could trace the history of conceptualization of development, how social scientists has understood development. And after the Second World War in the 50s and 60s, one could have what we call modernization theories, no? which is the idea that we need capital investment and new technologies in order to produce and consume more. Um, this is really what would be at the base of mainstream uh, economics. Later on in the 60s and 70s, this has been challenged, for example, by Marxists uh, in what have been called, for instance, in Latin America, dependency theories. The idea that um, there is, the world is divided uh, between the center and the periphery, and the center is always dominating. So there is no hope for the periphery to develop, right? But then later on in the 80s and the 90s came also what we call today a cultural critique. This come from post-structuralism. So if you ever heard of Michel Foucault, for example. So the idea that concepts like development are basically social construction. So they are invention of uh, societies and therefore can be deconstructed. And this is what I try to do uh, today. So if you want, my talk focuses a little bit more 
uh, on these cultural critiques that came from the 80s and the 90s. And then later on, I think nowadays in the year 2000, so where we are now, um, I would be so arrogant to argue that we have entered into a new phase in which I'm also part of, and we are also part of, in which we are not only making a critique of development, but we are exploring alternatives uh, to it. And I think the Rethinking Economics group in Kiel uh, is part of this uh, movement that is trying to build uh, alternatives, or at least to recognize that they are there and, and look at them. So sorry for the very long introduction. We lasted more than five minutes. And, and let's get into the talk, uh, changing some slides that sometimes make it a little bit more light, right? So as I said, uh, I will first address the question of what is the, uh, development, which might seem uh, trivial, but I think it is not. And then I will review the main arguments uh, of the critiques to development. And then I will discuss a little bit the implication and what the alternatives to be this uh, could be. So if this was a class and we had more time, uh, we're gonna have some kind of participatory dynamic in which you would have to define what is development for you. And this is not an easy question, I think, for anyone. You could quickly check, check Wikipedia if you want, or the Oxford Dictionary, or there might be some German dictionary, but it's not so straight uh, forward. In economics, assuming you, most of you are economic students, what you see on the screen would be uh, the most common definition of development. So Rostow, this economist, proposed that there are different stages in which uh, countries go through from a traditional society to a high mass consumption uh, society. And, and basically, as you pass to one stage to the other, you're becoming more and more developed. And one indicator that could be used uh, to trace this kind of uh, development or evolution is GDP uh, growth. And the idea of Rostov was that all the countries would go through this uh, process. The truth, after more than 50 years, is that developed countries, the rich countries are still rich, but poor countries are still poor with very few uh, exceptions. Later on, there have been more advanced uh, definition and understanding of development. For example, the one of the Nobel Prize, um, Amartya Sen, who understand development as freedom. So not only in strictly economic terms, but in terms of capabilities, no? what you are able uh, to do. Um, as I mentioned before, um, there is being a question of development. One of the most important authors is this uh, Swiss uh, economist who is called Gilbert Ries. It was a very interesting book on the history of development. And he tries to give a definition of development. So he says that development consists, and I'm reading, of a set of practices sometimes appearing in conflict one with the other, which require for the reproduction of society, the general transformation and destruction of the natural environment and social relations. Its aim is to increase the production of commodities, goods, and services here by the way of exchange to effective demand. So more and more uh, GDP growth. This, I think, is a good definition of, of development. However, it's very difficult to give one single definition of development. For instance, Arturo Scopal argues that, and again, I'm reading the quote, for many development is the ineluctable strategy by which poor countries need to modernize. This is the original idea. For other, it is an imperial imposition by the rich capitalist countries on the poor ones, and as such, it should be opposed. This would be the Marxist perspective, dependency theory. For yet other, it is a discourse invented by the West for the cultural domination of non-Western society that needs to be denounced as such beyond its economic effects. And this would be the post-development perspective from the 80s and the 90s. However, for many common people the world over, Finally, development has become either a reflection of their aspiration to a dignified life, and I, I acknowledge this and I respect this, or a utterly destructive process with which they have to coexist and not infrequently both at the same time. So for example, if you look, um, you can type um, in Google the Environmental Justice Atlas, we have documented more than 3,000 environmental conflicts around the world, which are basically uh, development projects which are having impacts on local communities and therefore these communities are protesting. Somehow they are protesting against development or at least against uh, development projects. So the main idea here of Arturo Escobar is that it is impossible to provide a single definition of uh, development. 
when who was the first one to introduce the concept of development in the way we understand today? The truth is that, uh, according to different historians, it was basically Truman, uh, the president of the United States, who gave this inaugural speech in 1949. Normally, in the longer class, I would also show the speech, which is quite interesting. But he makes four different points, and one of these is that he says that in the world, there are developed nations, rich nations, and there are underdeveloped nations. This is the first time in history in which somebody conceptualizes um, world geopolitics in these uh, terms no, of development. Um, and then it is quite interesting because he's saying that the United States as a kind of a humanitarian project will transfer capital and technology to poor countries for them to develop. To develop. So this is presented as a kind of humanitarian uh, project out of altruism. In reality, as I will argue in a moment, this is the Truman here was outlining the plan for uh, American imperialism around the world. Um, before we get into that, um, well, let's skip this, which is not too important. But to give to close a little bit this debate on what is development. Let's still share this reflection from a Mexican uh, intellectual, which Gustavo Esteva, who says, in my view, development is no longer a myth, a taboo, a promise, or a threat. It is an obsession, an addiction, a pathological mania that some people suffer in their mind, their emotion, or their behavior, and also a tool of domination and control. So as I'm speaking, I'm sure many of you are thinking, well, but development is a good thing. Why are you attacking it? Or why are you so critical with it? And this is what I try to argue in my talk, that um, although development looks as a sum of uh, good human aspiration, it has become a tool of domination. And we have to recognize this. And development in the way it is presented, it becomes also an obstacle for proposing uh, radical alternatives. So the first people that I think made a very interesting critique of development is a book that if you're interested in this topic, you could read are the following ones that published this book in 1992, um, in which they uh, claimed that they were writing the obituary of development, not because development was dead as an idea, but the promise of development was dead. The promise up to the uh, 90s was that all poor countries in the world could develop in the sense that they could become rich. In the 80s, it's starting to get clear that this is not going to happen. In fact, historically, this has not happened, right? So there is a questioning of development. And this book is an interesting one. It's, um, and we use it as a, um, as a source of inspiration for our Pluriverse book. It's a dictionary. So it's taking fundamental concepts of development, like environment, market, needs, planning, population, etc. And he's trying to give a definition for each of these uh, concepts. Uh, all of the authors in this book have become very important, uh, generally in social sciences and in development studies. Uh, but let's let's review the main arguments of these people would be of the post-development uh, scholar, right? Uh, I will share the PowerPoint so that you can look at the references later on if you're interested. Basically, these people from the 90s are arguing that development is at the core of the Western imaginary. And what would be this? Basically, the idea that growth or progress should be able to continue indefinitely, and that constant growth of production, GDP growth, if you want, the gross domestic product growth, will make the future self evidently better. So this is something that cannot be questioned, right? That's how it is. However, these people, the post-development scholar, are arguing that this understanding of development is a concept that is constructed within a particular history and culture, and therefore, as a social construction, can be deconstructed, right? Uh, one interesting question here is, who has the power to define what is the pro problem and how it can be solved? And let me give an example. If you define poverty as a lack of income, then the response to it automatically becomes that you need to increase income and therefore you need economic growth. And this is self-evident, necessary and universal truth. But if you understand poverty 
as the result of colonialism, as the result of the lack of redistribution or land reform or whatever, then the response to poverty can be very different. For instance, the redistribution. Why don't we redistribute the wealth that we already have instead of generating more? Because for instance, if you look at GDP growth in the last decade uh, in developed countries, the GDP growth, the benefits from it are not going to poorer section, poorer uh, people in society, but they're just going to the 1%. So basically GDP growth is just benefiting uh, the richest people in the world, not the poor ones. What would benefit the poor ones would be a redistribution, right? But this is not the understanding of development. So in the moment in which in the 50 development is introduced and Truman uh, introduces it in his speech, it makes a big switch in history. So suddenly uh, colonialism, which was the historical model imposed by Europe in which you had colonizer and colonized. So Europe is colonizer and Africa, for example, is colonized. You have a switch in which uh, the United States is trying to impose a kind of anti-colonial imperialism, in which is redefining the colonizer as developed and the underdeveloped as colonized. So in Truman, in his speech, it's a very colonial discourse. So the North is projected, is described as advanced and progressive, and the South is pictured as a kind of a backward degenerate or primitive. So this, you understand, is, is very colonial in its own uh, term. And therefore, President Truman understands or presents underdevelopment as a lack, not as a result of historical circumstances, for example, colonialism, right? And what would be the response to a lack? Well, as I said before, transfer of technical knowledge, capital investment, and more production. But this, in the end, ends up benefiting only the United States and not the poor people in these countries, right? And this is what is really problematic. One could discuss also what is the situation today in which obviously the United States is losing its center role um, as a kind of a world imperialist. And we are moving into a multipolar world in which China is uh, raising very much in importance. You have a, we have a kind of a new Cold War, et cetera, et cetera. So we could discuss the geopolitics of nowadays. However, I think development is still there and is still put forward um, as the way uh, forward. For instance, China is very much investing very heavily in Africa in what we would understand as development uh, projects. So are these development projects in the Bhutan, or is this a different form of colonialism, uh, which we call development in order to make it look more uh, acceptable? I historically speaking, uh, what President Truman introduced had four, uh, I think, important uh, implications. First, that as I just said, it created a new set of international uh, relations. Second, that inequality was justified, so that if development is, this, is a basically a synonym of economic growth, uh, the idea that wealth can be generalized to everyone on earth, and therefore injustice is a temporary state of affairs, and we don't need redistribution. Third, that historically it went beyond the kind of an ideological divide between communism and capitalism. And fourth, that there was a standard unit of measure uh, to measure development, and this was GDP, gross domestic uh, problem. So in the understanding of post-development scholar, development has become an euphemism to Western hegemony in the sense that it is the only possible uh, way forward and it is based on one knowledge system, which is basically the Western one. In this sense, we say that development is an imposition of the Western war of the rich countries upon other countries uh, in the world, right? By this, I do acknowledge that there are many people in the South that use as a name to, for their aspiration development, and I'm totally fine with it, I respect it, but this doesn't mean that it's, need, it's not part of the colonial history of these uh, countries, right? So, my son is trying to get into the room, as you can see. And my wife is trying to stop him. Um, but by going back to the definition of development, nowadays, development is basically a sum of virtuous human uh, aspirations. So well-being, progress, justice, think of the sustainable development goals. 
So how can you be critical of it if it sounds so nice? But be careful, as I always tell to my students, between the difference between the rhetoric and the action and the practice. So the rhetoric of the World Bank is sustainable development goals, but the action is still displacing people for building dams and building roads and corruption and so on. So somehow we also argue that development has become a kind of what we call a plastic war in the thing that no longer means anything except what the speaker wanted to mean. So it is very difficult for people to give uh, to agree on a single definition of uh, development. Again, here I'm, I'm uh, reporting the definition by uh, Gilbert Ries. In general, I think we could even go further and argue that development has become a kind of a new religion. And why do I say religion? With a lot of respect for uh, religious people and, and spiritual people, but in the sense that it is different from an ideology because an ideology can be questioned, but not a religion, because a religion by definition is the belief of a given social group in certain indisputable myths or truth, right? So in the case of development, one of these myths would be that technological progress can solve any of the problems, for instance, climate change. So you don't have to change your lifestyle, right? So because development has become a kind of a new religion, it becomes very difficult it becomes very difficult to challenge it because there is a kind of a social consensus around it in which everyone agrees on something. But really, when everyone agrees on something, I think you have to be careful because there is something wrong in it. So, for example, everyone, all the political parties agree that we need economic growth, but I think it is uh, highly problematic, right? Of course, in the history of development, the critiques that have been made to development have been reincorporated because uh, the mainstream is always able to co-op the critics. So for instance, you have had human development or gender and development or local development or sustainable development, different adjectives, right? To try and modify a little bit what development means. But in the end, the central idea of what development is, it's still there. So for example, if you look at the sustainable development goals, they're all very nice, gender and environment, inequality, poverty, anger, but uh, the sustainable development uh, goal number eight, it is about decent uh, jobs and sustained growth at 7%. This is nonsense, you know? And this tells you that the central idea what I've been facing historically um, of development, it is still uh, there. So what we try to do as post-development scholar is to challenge uh, this idea. And already to conclude this part, uh, the idea here is that we are looking at this course, and this is what post-structuralism is about. And this is really not part of economics. I mean, economics is, uh, mainstream economics is not concerned about this course. Uh, but in the understanding of post-development, we are very much influenced, for instance, by cultural anthropology and so on. Um, we could discuss about power. So in the understanding of post-development scholar, this course, has become a sufficient guarantee of social power. To do what? To intervene, to transform, and to rule. So in this sense, the rhetoric is always preferable to force if it serves the purpose of persuading people. So what is the idea here? If you can convince countries around the world to do what you want them to do with the rhetoric of development, this is good enough. If they don't, then you always have military intervention, like in the case of Iraq, Afghanistan, and so on. But first, you will start with, with this course, right? Because it is a little bit easier and more acceptable also in your society. So to summarize and conclude, post-development scholars try to do a kind of a deconstruction. So they not only challenge development, but they try to challenge the economic science as a kind of a mental uh, colonization. So economics is uh, colonizing not only the minds of economic students, but also of other uh, disciplines. And economics is not open at all to a variety of methods, for example, or to influence from other uh, disciplines. And I think this is highly uh, problematic. So for post development scholar, I think we need to decolonize ourselves uh, from economics. In fact, there is an interesting book uh, which is called The Invention of Economics by uh, Serge Latouche, a French scholar, 
because when we say, for example, when we talk of sustainable development and we say, look, there is the environment, there is society, and there is the economy, and sustainable development looks at how the three spheres interact, obviously, this is an abstraction that is an invention of humankind. There is no such a thing as a society, environment, and economy separated. In fact, the economy as a matter is a reality and does not exist. It's an abstraction of humankind. It's an in, in this sense, it is an invention, right? Which is fine. There is nothing wrong with it. But but the problem is that sometimes economists think that they're like natural scientists, no? And that they have some kind of universal uh, truth, right? And I think for social scientists to claim that they hold some kind of universal truth, I think it is really, really uh, problematic. Think of the concept of, for example, work in the sense of paid work of labor, right? Uh, nowadays, if I say labor, you think of somebody selling his or her time on the labor market and getting a salary in exchange of it. But in the history of humankind, this has never been the case. This is a very recent phenomenon in the history of humankind since the re industrial revolution. Or the fact, for example, that land can be sold in the market, that you can buy a piece of land or you can sell it to somebody else and that there is a market for this. This is a, a fiction. If you want to read the classic, you can read uh, Carpolani, The Great Transformation, right? Uh, in which we, he talks about fictitious commodity, which is exactly labor, land, and money, right? So uh, something that is considered to be natural or normal nowadays within economics, it is not. <laughs> and it has never been in the minds of people uh, in the history of humankind. So I think to have this historical perspective also on the concept, I think it is important to, to understand better. And if we also want to make a critique of, of mainstream or classical uh, economics, right? Therefore, if we can do this deconstruction uh, of uh, development, then this hopefully opens up the door for a matrix of alternatives. If we can decolonize our uh, mind from the economic science, then we can think with more uh, and feel also with more freedom and think of different realities or realize that there are already different realities in the real world that do not work along the lines of what mainstream or classical economics uh, is saying, right? So this would be what, what we call a pluriverse uh, of uh, alternative and of which we make an inventory in our pluriverse book. In the pluriverse book, we don't spend a lot of time making a critique of development. We understand that this has already been done and critique is important and resistant in the case of social movement, resisting, I don't know, like Ende Gelende in Germany, you know, the extraction of coal, it's very important and we should be with them, but critique and resistance are not enough. We need our own alternative. Um, what kind of world do we imag imagine or do we envision? And we need to decolonize our mind or to decolonize our social imaginary in order to, um, to imagine something uh, different. And this is a little bit what we do with the Pluriverse book in which we are not inventing everything, but we are looking around, uh, especially in the global South. And we are seeing that there are many people that have challenged uh, development in theory and in practice also and that they put forward um, different alternatives. This could be, for example, uh, Ubuntu in, um, in the southern part of Africa, or Buen Vivir in Latin America, which is this idea that Alberto Acosta has been uh, talking a lot about. Maybe you can invite him for a, a talk in this series. He speaks German also, and he, come, he used to come often to Germany. Uh, not the case right now, but I think he misses uh, German, you know? But when we hear is this idea that comes, for example, from indigenous community in the Andeans, um, in which they are not aspiring for more, and they don't want to join the development project from the Western uh, system of knowledge. They, they aspire for a good life, which is a simple life in which they can live well. Uh, and this is not a new idea. This is an idea that... Uh, it's very ancient that comes from their cultural tradition and that has been lately recognized, theorized also, and that ended up in the constitutions, for example, of uh, Ecuador 
um, and Bolivia. So this, I think, is is interesting, not just to give uh, an idea. A uh, part of this pluriverse of alternatives, there is this idea of, of degrowth, uh, which is more specific if you want to uh, Europe. Let me drink some water. Federico, you ask for a reminder when 15 minutes are left. So. Super fantastic. I, I should be done in, in about 10 minutes. My son was also crying because I think I didn't say a lot to him. Right? Go and play with it. He's been crying, I think, now for 10 minutes non stop. Um, but anyway, so, so I was saying part of this um, blue rivers, I think, from Europe, there are different ideas, but one of these is degrowth, um, which degrowth has two main origins. One is post development, what I just explained. And the other would be political ecology. The idea that infinite economic growth is impossible in a finite planet. Uh, this is also my field of expertise, which is ecological economics, which is all this debate on whether uh, economic growth is compatible with ecological sustainability. I will not go into the details now, but we can if you want in the, in the debate. But out of these uh, two roots, the growth comes out as a critique of uh, the understanding that economic growth can solve all the problems in, in our society and is a proposal for a different kind of society. One in which we would produce and consume less, we would redistribute so it would be a more just society, we would change our social relation also in terms of gender, um, and basically in which we would put the well being, or if you want, life at the center and not economic growth. Because the problem right now is that we are. Society, for instance, in Europe are putting growth at the center of everything with the idea that if we get growth, we will get employment, we will get, uh, I don't know, enough money to pay for education, health, whatever, and so on. But the idea here is not to put economic growth at the center, which is supposed to be a mean. Let's leave economic growth on the side, let's leave GDP on the side, and let's put life at the center. So there are feminist economists in Spain, which are very interesting, and they have this perspective which they call the sustainability of life, la sostenibilidad de la vida. And they ask two central questions, which I think you can ask yourself individually and politically. The first one, and the two are related, of course. The first one is um, what a good life means for you individually. What, what do you aspire in your life? To get a good job, buy a house, buy a car, uh, have kids, etc., etc. We are all influenced by our society, so we are embedded in this society. So I all, I'm also influenced by this kind of tendency, you know? but is it really this what makes our life worth living? I think it's interesting to ask individually and socially speaking also. And second is, in relation to the kind of life we aspire to, how are we going to sustain it? but to sustain it in ecological terms, but also in social terms, for example. So who is going to do the care work? Who is going to take care of children, like my wife is taking care of uh, right now, right? Um, who is going to buy food? Who is going to cook? Who is going to clean? Who is going to give emotional support to, to who? You know that disproportionately this work which is often called unpaid labor or unpaid work or care work, uh, falls upon women, right? If we want a different society, how are we going to redistribute care work? I think this is an interesting question uh, for our life. So you are younger than me. So you might leave, uh, maybe you share your flats with other people. And one of the most problematic things when you share flats, it has to do with care work who buys food, who cooks, who cleans the dishes, uh, who cleans the house, uh, who gives emotional support. This is all about care. I'm, I mean, I've lived in shared spaces for a long time myself, and these were always very problematic. So we have to, and we are not ready for this. So we have to think, I think, a little bit more. And this is what these feminists, with the perspective of the sustainability of life, mean when they say we have to put the life at the center. So degrowth aspires to put life at the center. Um, let me skip this. Uh, of course, degrowth is meant 
as a, what we call a missile war. So it's a kind of a provocation where everyone agrees uh, that we need economic growth uh, to get out of the crisis. Then if you want to make a provocation, then you can say you're in favor of degrowth. This doesn't mean that I'm, ask, I'm calling for a decrease of GDP. No, no, I'm saying that we should forget about what happens to GDP and put at the center of our society what really matters. Equity, sustainability, well-being, gender equality, we can discuss it, right? Um, so degrowth in this sense is, is, a, is a provocation. And it's even, um, it disturbs people. And, and many people say, oh, but degrowth is not a good slogan because it is not nice, it's not positive. Yes, and this is the point. This is what we want to do when we say that we want to decolonize the imaginary. Because in our minds, we are used, we are trained to think that more is always better. And we want to put on the table uh, that small is beautiful. Too. So in this sense, uh, we are not trying to give a very complex theoretical uh, mathematical model of the elephant and the snail. We are not trying if our society, if the elephant, um, which is a little bit too fat, we don't want to make put this elephant on a diet. So we want to, don't want to make this elephant to become thinner, but we want to transform the elephant, which would be our industrial societies, in something completely different, which could be a snail. Why do we use uh, the picture of, of the snail? And if you want to laugh, I even have a snail tattoo on my neck. Um, the idea is that the snail is interesting because it has a, the sense of limit in build. What do I mean? When the snail is growing, uh, you know it has a spiral, no? Which keeps growing. And then at a certain point, it stops. Why does it stop? Well, because if it would continue to grow, first it would not be able to move. And then since the growth is exponential because it is a spiral, it would be so heavy that the, it, the snail would collapse on itself and would basically die. So this is what is interesting for our society, that our society are not accepting that they are mature enough to stop growing and focusing on just enjoying life, right? And the snail also, of course, goes very slow, which I think is something we could uh, enjoy more in, in our life, to be a little bit uh, slower. If you want to learn more about the Grove, I have these uh, two books, the Degrowth Vocabulary. It's uh, a vocabulary, again, inspired by the Development Dictionary, uh, which tries to uh, clarify the most inter important terms that we use in this debate, and then the introduction to the book um, defines what we mean by Digo. This book has been translated in more than 10 languages, including German, uh, and you can find it in PDF online if you don't want to buy it. And then the second book, uh, The Case for Digo, uh, is a more recent book that we published in September, uh, in which we focus a little bit more, not so much on what the problem is, but how we can get out of this mess. So it's a little bit more on the strategies and the actor. What can be done? How can we do it? Who is going to do it? And so on. And we make an argument that individual actions should go together with action at the community level, at the city level, and the political institution level. We use the example of, of Barcelona and Spain, in which there's been some interesting experiences, uh, we think, in these senses. And we make concrete experience. We mention and discuss concrete experiences, and we make a lot of uh, proposals. The second one, the case for Degrowth, is a very short book and is also a very cheap book. A group of volunteers is translating it into German. If you want to help, uh, send me an email and, and that would be great. Uh, and then in the Global South, uh, I think, as these two authors say, the mood is the search for alternatives in the deeper sense that is aiming to break away from the cultural and ideological base of development, bringing forth other imaginary goals and practices. And this is what we try to uh, collect in the book, uh, Blue Rivers. As Arturo Escobar also argue, I think it is important to resist falling into the trap of thinking that while the North needs to degrow, the South needs development. Um, Arturo Escobar says that there is an important synergy to be gained from discussing degrow and alternatives to development in tandem while respecting their geopolitical and epistemic specificity. If you want, I'm gonna end in a minute because I've already spoken for a lot. Um, I've been in India for a long time, 
doing field work for my PhD. And there are lots of debates in India that uh, growth should be inclusive and green, but this is an admission that growth up to now in India has been neither inclusive nor green. So it has not benefited poor people and it has been very much destructive uh, to the environment. So in this book, Blue Rivers, we uh, review many alternatives. I'll share uh, in a minute the link in the chat. You can find this book, The Blue Rivers, uh, available online in PDF. You can buy it if you want a physical copy, but it is in Creative Commons uh, because we think this idea uh, has to be shared uh, openly. So now would be the time for a beer if I were with you in, in, uh, in Germany. Um, it has been a pleasure being with you. These beers were uh, done for the Degrowth Conference. There is a Degrowth Conference, every international Degrowth Conference every year. This year, there are two happening in fact in the summer, one in Manchester and one in The Egg in the Netherlands. So you're very much um, invited to look at them. And then I will also share in a minute in the chat, I'm organizing a summer school here in Barcelona, but it will be an online summer school. I'm sorry about that. On very much what I've been discussing, and it is feminist and ecological macroeconomics. So I think we need uh, to train the economists for the 21st century, and I think this is what rethinking economics still is trying to do. And uh, my proposal, if you are interested, is this summer school, and I will share in a minute uh, the link. Fees are very low. It's a five days course in which we will review the main arguments, uh, we will look at the models, and so on. Uh, it is fought for students of economics, but anyone is, is welcome who, who just if you are interested in these topics, then you are most welcome to join and you will find like-minded uh, people. We organize also in Barcelona a summer school on degrowth and environmental justice every year. Registration for this year are already closed, but, but you are welcome. And then last also in Barcelona, we have a master degree in political ecology, degrowth, and environmental justice. So if you're interested in these topics, please do come and, and join us. It would be uh, great to, to have you here. So I guess I've spoken for too long already. So let me stop here and, and start the discussion. Thanks a lot. Yes. Thank you so much, Federico. I don't think it was too long. I thought it was very, very interesting, very inspiring. Um, when you send a message in the chat, make sure you select all panelists and attendees, otherwise they won't get it. Okay, we have already received some questions and I'm sure people are busy typing the questions right now. Uh, the first one is from, an, yeah, oh, God. <laughs> sorry. Uh, the first one I will read out because we don't know it was anonymous. Um, but it's a very good question. I love the idea of development as a religion, they say. The current system for many people just seems inevitable and given or unchangeable. How can we start, think, start talking to people that are completely constrained by the boundaries, frameworks of neoliberalism and simply cannot even imagine different systemic frames. How do we talk to them, Federico? Do you want to take uh, the question one by one? Yeah, I think that's best. OK. So um, it's a good question. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> uh, It is tough, you know. Uh, it is not easy, and I don't have the the answer. If anybody has insights, they're most welcome. Um, I think, to me, one interesting question is the following: Is the development project and all its reincarnation, which is human development, sustainable development, now is the ecological transition, next generation, new green deal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, no? They are all promising. Promising in the sense that they have promises, in the sense that they promise that they will end with inequalities, they will end with poverty, gender inequalities, unsustainability, and so on. But as time passes, this is not is not taking place. So inequalities are on the rise climate change is getting worse and worse, 
uh, unemployment among young people is very high, above 40% here in Spain, but not much better in Germany, I think, et cetera, et cetera. So despite there is a rhetoric that things are going well, the macroeconomy is going well, GDP is going up, and there will be a recovery, the reality is not, it's not the same as the rhetoric. So I wonder whether people will start realizing this at a certain point. So if I had to talk with someone who believes in the mainstream project, I would say, I would ask them, do you think that the mainstream project is actually responding to the challenges that we are facing nowadays or not? Because, for example, in the case of sustainable development, sustainable development was proposed in the 1980s, mid 80s. So we are basically at three decades after sustainable development was proposed. I think the time has come to do an evaluation. So was sustainable development a success or a failure? Well, it depends what your objective were. If sustainable development is evaluated in terms of what it was promised, that it would improve the sustainability of the economy, it was a clear failure. There is no single environmental indicator that has improved since then, apart from a few exceptions which are really minor. If the idea of sustainable development was to push back radical critiques from the 70s, like degrowth and limits to growth and so on, and kind of co-op this critique in a kind of a mainstream narrative, then it was a great success. You know what I mean? So I don't have a magic bullet, but I would just ask these people, until when are you going to cheat people? I think there is a big cheating project going on. Yes, thank you very much. Frank has a question who will ask it in person to you. Yeah, thanks Federico for uh, the presentation. Um, I got a couple of questions on company level um, because I, I wonder if we need to change something there and not only into the framework um, of the whole economic system. So how do you picture companies to be governed and organized internally in a degrowth world? Is there a difference to the way companies are organized today? In face of the ecological crisis, do companies continue to operate in a market economy that just happens to be more regulated? Uh, thank you, Frank. So, so that's an interesting question. Uh, so I've shared the an article, I guess you can see my screen right now. Uh, there was an interesting article, I think, uh, tackling this question in the Harvard Business Review uh, with this very provocative title of why the growth shouldn't uh, scare businesses. Um, and I have a friend also, who, Mario Pancera, uh, who just got one of these large um, research project funded by the European Research Council with 2 million euro to exactly explore uh, the question you are raising of how we could imagine uh, the role of businesses and organization in a degrowth uh, world. Um, and he also has looked specifically at issues like technological innovation. Can we have innovation in the post-growth uh, economy or, or not? And he's actually hiring PSD and postdoc. So if anyone in the room is interested, uh, you can check it up. I'll, I'll share the link in a minute. Um, so of course, here there is a problem, no? That um, in in the way that companies are um, organized nowadays, they are always looking for growth. The, the the rule there is basically grow or die, right? So, so one could look at experiences like, for example, the social and solidarity economies, uh, which is organized around networks and they're normally cooperatives in which are trying to put at the center of their activity, not only the maximization of uh, economic benefits, but also other values. And there are interested experiences also of way of evaluating uh, companies, not only according to their economic output, but to the social value they produce, um, the quality um, of life of their own workers, the gender equality, et cetera, et cetera. So 
what I mean here is that I think there is a different way of uh, doing business. However, obviously, this is not <laughs> how um, the mainstream businesses are organized nowadays. And they have an interest for a system that is centered around growth. So we could also discuss what would be the obstacle towards degrowth. And my guess would be the multinational corporation would be certainly uh, there. They're benefiting from uh, growth and they don't want it to stop. So this is a little bit related to the former question. We could ask economic growth, who, whom, whom does it benefit? Um, and my response would be that, well, it benefits the richest and not the poorest. So I think it will have to come uh, as a pressure from below and from the poorest uh, for change. I don't expect much change coming from businesses. Although there are people that are sensitive, uh, they're not stupid. People like Bill Gates have good advisors and they know that climate change is there and something has to be done about it. But I don't have many hopes uh, of what will come from things like corporate social responsibility and so on. Another thing that uh, I'm, I can share in the chat in a minute, there was a, a special issue in the journal uh, called Organization on Degrowth very recently that might be interesting for you to Thank you both for Frank for the question and Federico for the answer. The next question is from Karen. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, about the scenarios that would mean for, I'm thinking on middle and low income countries if not is it if i mean if not through growth and development would be what will be then the path to get out of poverty uh to millions of people that are now in that situation assuming not just poverty as an income condition, also like a, in a multidimensional level. So how could be the way of, of that type of countries? Um, and also if slowing the rhythm of the elephant wouldn't put, in order to become a, a snail, wouldn't put the countries in a secular stagnation scenario? Thank you, Karen. So let me start from the second one. Uh, this I didn't say. So basically in the degrowth uh, literature, uh, we spend a lot of time in making an ecological critique of growth um, and on other issues. No? For example, there is all literature on happiness in economics. No? Neoclassical economists would assume that an increase of income would increase utility and therefore well-being. Also, this has been questioned a lot. The relationship between growth and inequalities, for instance, you can look at the work of uh, Piketty. Um, Piketty would make the argument that if you don't have economic growth, you can have an increase in inequalities. But, but other people have argued that this depends on the policies that you do. Uh, so, for instance, since the 70s, we have had a lot of uh, economic growth, but inequalities have also gone up. And this, I would argue, is mainly because of neoliberal uh, policies. So, so these relationships are, are difficult. But, but there is an extra argument of why I think there is legitimacy nowadays in asking the question, how can we manage an economy without growth? And, and, and the response to it is because Economists are not economies are not growing as they used to do, at least in the developed uh, world. So even the IMF has been recognizing now for a few years that we are entering what they call a new norm, and other people like Lawrence Summers would call secular stagnation, as we just said, right? Um, so the fact that even if you look at China and India, even before uh, the COVID nineteen crisis, they were not growing at ten percent anymore. So if economies are not growing as they used to be, what do we do about that? Of course, a lot of efforts have 
gone into making it grow again. So as a response to the 2008 crisis, all the austerity policies, right? And, and nowadays the recovery plan, so lots of investment, quantitative easing and so on, which you could enter into the details if you want. Um, but the idea here is that I think asking the question of how can we manage an economy without growth is legitimate, even if you think that growth is a good thing because our economies are not growing as they used to do. So here there is the field of ecological macroeconomics on which the summer course I'm organizing is uh, all about in which exactly we try to explore this question. So for example, there is an interesting article in Nature Sustainability um, in the journal Nature Sustainability, which is called Feasible Alternatives to Grow, which explore the growth scenario and it shows how the growth scenario are much better than scenarios of green growth, for example, in terms of uh, fulfilling um, the objective of the Paris Agreement regarding climate change, uh, for example. So I don't think that degrowth would make countries fall into secular stagnation or crisis or recession or whatever. The lack of GDP as a name in economics and it's called the recession. Degrowth is not about recession. It's a different uh, project of managing the economy in a different way. In 2018, uh, with more than 200 scientists, we brought a letter to the European Commission saying that Europe should stop focusing on, on GDP and should focus on well-being. Obviously, they didn't pay attention to us, but if they would have paid attention to us, they would have been much more better prepared to react to the COVID-19 crisis, in which basically is a kind of, is a situation in which you have um, a stop in the production and consumption because of the lockdown, and then suddenly your economy collapses because it is organized around growth. So with degrowth, we have been thinking about how we can organize an economy in a different way for more than a decade. So I think we are better prepared than macroeconomists, neoclassical macroeconomists, who just think how to make the economy grow again, right? Um, so in relation to the other question of poverty and inequality, obviously, if you look from the perspective of development, uh, when I criticize uh, development and economic growth, it is normal and it is totally legitimate to think, okay, but then what do we do with poor people and inequalities? Then my response is, we redistribute. <laughs> and this is difficult to think in, 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 in our minds because we have been trained or, or brainwashed to think that the only response to poverty and inequality is growth. No, there is a different response, which is a redistribution between countries and within countries. Then you can tell me that this politically is not feasible. I accept it. It's a difficult part. Fair enough. But I can also say that growth has not solved poverty and inequalities uh, in the global so south up to now. Then you, you can tell me as a counter argument. So I'm, I'm just I'm like... A, mimicking a debate, no? But so, so then you can tell me, but the World Bank says that hundreds of millions of people have come out of poverty. Well, then look into the detail of the methodology they use to say that. If you define poverty as less than one dollar a day, and then on the basis of that, you say that millions of people have come out of poverty, then I think you're making a trick because a kilo of rice in India costs almost uh, half a dollar. So one dollar a day is not going to be enough to live. You know what I mean? So and these are a lot of debates on, for instance, the Millennium Development Goals, right? Uh, on whether they were accomplished or not. On this, however, on this topic, you can see the book, if you are interested, which is called The Divide by Jason Ickel, which is all about this, right? But my main argument would be here, my simple argument to simplify and not make it too long is you don't need growth to solve poverty. What you need is redistribution of wealth. That's all you need. Uh, between countries, because you recognize that there is historical debt of rich countries towards poor one because of colonialism, right? Uh, and because of unequal trade exchange. And, uh, and within countries, because I think now nowadays, it, I think it's, become more and more problematic to talk about the global north and the global south because there are lots of poor people in Europe and there are lots of rich people in India, for instance. So we have to focus a little bit more on, on, on social groups or social classes or, or whatever. 
if you are an economist and you are motivated, you can look about what is called uh, the macroeconomics of uh, stratification, which looks at inequality from a perspective of gender, uh, of class, of race, etc. What this is called intersectionality, in the sense how all these dimensions, race, class, uh, gender, etc., etc., intersect and in the end produce and reproduce uh, inequalities. Uh, I could go on and on on, on this, but, but I would leave it there not to make it uh, too heavy. But if you are interested, I, I, yours is a very good question and very respectable, but I would invite you to look at the work of, of Jason Eaton because it's very interesting. He is a, an anthropologist at the London School of uh, Economics who is in fact moving to Barcelona to work with us uh, as a professor here and also professor of uh, our master in political ecology, the growth and environment. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we have another anonymous question regarding the growth, um, more towards as to how to achieve the growth. Well, it's two questions actually. So the first one is, how do you get the critical mass that needs to believe? Like, how do you get the critical mass that you need to believe in the growth? And the second question is, how do you change the system once you have that critical mass? I have a very quick response to that. Read, other, read our book, The Case for the Growth. <laughs> That's a cheap response. Um, but this is this is what the book is all about because debates on degrowth, uh, degrowth was launched as a slogan in the year 2000. So for more than a decade, we spent a lot of time um, at the time the economy was growing. So we were putting a lot of efforts on what is wrong with economic growth. Then suddenly the crisis 2008 came, so which reached a little bit and we became, I think, more mature and we started to think a little bit more on the politics of degrowth. So what, what can be done about it? How are we going to do it? Who is going to do it and for whom? So our book, The Case for Degrowth is all about this. Um, we put forward different policies proposal, uh, the New Green Deal, but uh, without growth. So a little bit different from the mainstream uh, option. We speak about universal care income uh, care income to visibility to give visibility to the care work that is done uh, mainly by women still uh, in our society. And then we propose uh, work sharing and work the reduction of working time and work sharing um, and a few other proposals. Right? Uh, on, on your question of how you get to a critical mass, we discuss a little bit the idea from Antonio Gramsci an Italian Marxist on, on what he calls the common sense. So um, what makes sense to people? Uh, when, you know, the extreme right wing says uh, migrants are coming to get our jobs, this somehow connects to people, you know, and, and we have to be careful with these dynamics and we have to try and, and understand it. Um, we know that rationally it is not the case, you know, migrants that are coming are getting, you know, jobs that nobody wants, etc., etc. But this is not how people perceive it. So we have to be uh, careful with what is called framing and people like Lakoff, we discuss a lot this issue in our uh, book, how to present ideas to, to people um, and then trying to connect with what makes sense to people. So if I tell people, look, money is not everything in life, it's a common sense, you know, everyone will agree with it. Uh, so this is something we can connect to people. Um, so this is a little bit the idea we, we build on in our book. The other issue that we put forward in our book in, in, the, in, in the sense of how we can uh, promote the transformation is that we don't have to invent everything from scratch. We have to realize that uh, there are lots of alternatives already going on. So capitalism is everywhere, modernity is everywhere, but there are still spaces of resistance of where this dimension have not reached. You know, there are still lots of dimension of reciprocity. For instance, 
today I'm here with you and I'm not getting paid. And I didn't expect, they, the organizer didn't tell me we cannot pay you. I didn't ask whether I, I was going to be paid. I'm here because I enjoy being with you. So this is part of reciprocity, you know. Um, so there are still, people do a lot of things in their life, not for money and not because they expect something in exchange. So we, in our book, we argue that we have to start and build on this. Uh, also not to get depressed, you know. I don't have a simple solution. And I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not here making a promise that the growth is around the corner, you know, and it's going to happen. I don't know if it's going to happen. <laughs> I argue for what I think um, would be a good idea. But the fact that it doesn't look too feasible in political terms nowadays doesn't stop me from saying it or arguing from it. I know that alone I cannot do it. So here I am today with you, you know, and I would pose the question to you, you know, what can we do about it? It's an open question. And I think alone we, we cannot do it, but we can do it together. So I think initiatives like the thinking economic skill are, are very good in this sense. And, um, and as I said, if you want to look more into the details, you can you can look at, at our book, The Case for Degrowth. It's a short book and relatively cheap also. Thank you. We have two more questions that are somewhat connected, both are asked anonymously. Uh, the first one is, what do you think about current alternatives like uh, economy for the common good or purpose economy? Are these useful transformations in the sense of degrowth or more like false friends because they are all, they are still coexisting with the current system of development? And the other question is, do you support any alternative to GDP accounting like gross national happiness or something to like? Good, they're, they're both uh, good questions. So the one about indicators, um, the issue is the following, that um, we don't have the time now, but basically GDP is um, was introduced as a weapon. So it was introduced by uh, the economist uh, Kuznet, uh, the idea was to check, to evaluate whether the United States was doing well or not, because they had to enter the Second World War. And they wanted to see whether um, the policies, the economic policies they were doing were giving good results or not, and whether they were strong enough to, to enter or sustain the war or not. Uh, however, the same uh, Kuznet that introduced it, that developed this uh, methodology of accounting, and said in several uh, instances that GDP was not a good indicator of progress. Uh, but, but nowadays GDP has become or has been looked at as an indicator of progress. So if GDP is growing, we are doing well. And this is problematic because it, it does what economics often does, that it reduces complexity. So one could also ask who has the power to reduce complexity? Uh, and in this sense is that the complexity of our societies are reduced to a single unit of measure that is money. The same mistake could be done with CO2. One could reduce complexity of our society to an accounting of CO2 emission. And this would be the, the same mistake. So I think what we need to do in terms of indicators is to accept that we live in a complex uh, societies and that therefore we need a set of indicators um, to tell us whether we are doing well or not. Uh, in this sense, we need social, environmental, gender, economics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We can keep GDP. I don't mind. Uh, GDP is a measure of um, how much is uh, produced or consumed within an economy in one year and measured in money. But but many things that happen in an economy that are important are not measured by money. For instance, unpaid work, since it is not paid for. It is not many. Nature is also not oxidants. The one I'm briefing right now as I'm speaking, it is not accounted for in money terms. So it doesn't count in GDP. There are people that are trying to put, to do monetary evaluation. If you are economists, you know this. This is nonsense, of course, you know, again, because of the complexity. So what is the value of nature? What is the value of bees that do pollination? You know, there are people who put the price on this 
how many millions and so on. But it's difficult. So for example, if you put a, a value to a monetary value to life, my life is more expensive than my friends in India. Why? Well, because my income is higher than their income. So is my life more worth than their life because I'm getting more money? There are a lot of complexity uh, related to monetary valuation that you can look at in ecological economics is full of it. But there is a concrete alternative to cost-benefit analysis, for example, because sometimes you need a decision-making tool, and I accept this. Or, for example, in the courts, when you, when you talk to judges, they need to be practical also. They don't want to discuss about theories, right? So you can use what is called multi-criteria evaluation, in which, in which you can have, you can evaluate different indicators at the same time, you can weight them and even give a single answer if you want, but you can give also, you can convey or give, improve the transparency of the decision-making process in which you give visibility to the fact, for example, that different stakeholders have different interests and therefore give different values to different indicators. Because this is what it happens in environmental conflicts, no? The enterprise says that a factory is generating a lot of employment, of course, a lot of money, which they don't say, but that is the point. And then the communities are saying, but the company is polluting the river. So of course, here you have different stakeholders with different values. So from an economic point of view, how do we, you reduce these multiple valuation languages to a single value? It's very difficult to reduce in monetary terms, I think. And this is also a problem that um, I think from a heterodox economics point of view or from a pluralist economics point of view, we don't have a theory of value. And I think this is something if you are interested in our core theory, we could discuss of in another session. What, what theory of value are we in favor of? It's not a simple uh, question, uh, I believe. Now I got a little bit lost and I'm, I'm starting to get tired. So the question was, oh yes, on the indicator. So I spoke too much about that. And on the other on, on there are different uh, alternatives. We review them in the Pluriverse book. We also try to divide them between false alternatives and transformative alternatives. This is difficult to do, you know. Uh, but just to go briefly, the economy of the common good, I'm not a fan of, to tell you the truth. I think it is a little bit of uh, the reincarnation of corporate social sustainability, uh, how is it called? Corporate social responsibility. I think it's a little bit moderate as a perspective. However, it is not bad. It is time to put the, the idea that uh, companies should be um, looking only at economic benefits, but say look also at uh, social and environmental benefits. And lots of people are following this perspective. So I respect it and I think it is interesting. I think another one that is more interesting is what is called donut economics by Kate Rayford, uh, with this idea again with the indicators of putting what, what she calls the social foundations and the planetary boundaries. This is a central problem here, even with the person who asked me before about poverty in the global south and so on. There is a problem with the clash, if you want, between human development and sustainable development, to use the mainstream terms, right? none of the countries in the world is able to provide a good life to its people within planetary boundaries. And this is a societal failure for everyone. There are people who do well in Europe. My son is coming because he wants to have dinner, so I'm gonna go with him in a minute. Vengo lì, un secondo. Si, lo so che vuoi mangiare. Adesso vengo, aspetta un momento. Finisco. So one issue there is that rich countries who do, or in general, countries who do well in terms of human development are also very polluting. So they're transpassing the planetary boundaries. No, they're, they have too many environmental impacts. On the other hand, you have poor countries who do better in environmental terms because they produce and consume well, uh, less, but they don't do so well in terms of human development. So the point is, how do we bring those closer in the sense within the planetary boundaries, but still providing a good life uh, for all. This, I think, uh, is not an easy question, uh, but is an interesting one. The perspective of donut economics is trying to put these two uh, perspectives together and give also an indicator. I think degrowth and all the alternatives we review 
in the Pluriverse book are uh, about this. So with this, I think I'll have to say goodbye. <laughs> we, yes, if we want to put life at the center, then this is what it means also. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect timing. We're done with our questions. Thank you so much for being with us, Federico, tonight. It was a great pleasure, a great honor <laughs> to have you here. Um, I think it was very interesting and we will put it on YouTube for everybody who did not have the chance to be here today. And we release you to have dinner with your family. Thanks, thanks much for the invitation and keep up with the good work and uh, see you in the streets, as we used to say before. Uh, <laughs> not to see you in, in Zoom only and come to Barcelona. Whenever you want, you're always welcome. Very good, Cheers. thank you very much. See you. Bye. Bye. Oops. I